Nearly every predominantly white institution, PWI in America, has a program and or organization that's been established to help students of color acclimate to an environment in which they might feel excluded from or unwelcome. These programs, despite their best intentions, sometimes miss the mark because of underfunding and the lack of exposure. But when they connect with their target demographic, they can heighten a student's overall collegiate experience during the tail end of their formative years. At USC, there are four main cultural centers serving Black, Latino, Asian, and LGBTQ students. Recently, the four organizations convened at the USC University Club to discuss the challenges they face at a private PWI. Like many other programs at USC, the cultural centers have seen their already low budgets slashed and are struggling to gain more recognition not only from students, but administrators as well. For this study, we'll focus on the Center for Black Cultural Student Affairs, headed by Dr. Rosalind Connerly. CBCSA is celebrating its 40th year at USC with a series of programs and events chronicling its rich history and traditions. Tonight is our second and well, final event. We've been celebrating our 40th anniversary of the Center for Black Cultural and Student Affairs All Academic Year. So tonight is Fest and it's our opportunity to again go to the roots of why our center exists and that's because of our students. So what does the center mean to you being at a uh, PWI? Yes, so I've been working at the Center for Black Culture and Student Affairs for four years now. I'm currently a senior, working since my freshman year. The center has provided a space um, of home, a family for me, of comfort. So anytime, you know, being at a predominantly white institution, I oftentimes am the only black student in some of my classes. And so then having the refuge and the space at the center gives me a lot of clarity, a lot of peace, and just a place to relax and unwind at the end of a stressful day. Uh, it's a place for me to interact with intellectual black uh, and African American students uh, that are like me, similar interests. Okay, um, well I'm a transfer student as of last fall, um, so coming to another PWI, the center is a really good place for me to feel like I'm getting acclimated and meeting new people who are trying to welcome me in and make sure that I have a really good experience and put on events such as Fest. I think the center is great as there's not that many of us, so when I'm able to see someone that looks like me, it's a great experience. Um, yeah, it's someone that we can connect. I agree with her. It's really an escape from like the rest of the world on campus because when it isn't that diverse on campus and especially in your classroom when you're the only one, it feels good to go somewhere and you can really connect with the people around you and joke and laugh and just really share your culture. So, okay. Do you feel that the university supports the cultural centers? Yeah, I do. I think they do a really good job actually of trying to like make us feel like, okay, I don't know about the student body, but like the university as a whole, like a huge thing, like the head people do, so, yeah. Okay. And sure. <laughs> you're not what? I said I'm not 100% sure. I haven't okay. seen anything particularly where I can be like, yeah, they do. So. Okay. Yeah. The cultural centers are an important part of USC's legacy and history and traditions, and they make a really valuable home space for many of our students who come here from different cultures and backgrounds, and even students who just want to learn about different cultures. Our cultural centers are home for that activity. Looking at this climate, how relevant, how relevant do you think uh, cultural centers still are at PWIs? Yeah, crucial. Uh, absolutely crucial. Probably more so now than ever, right? We have, um, you know, a, it's a time when people are incredibly um, feel disconnected. 
uh, and feel us, you know, when, when everything's swirling around you, where can you find a place to perch, right? Um, and I think people find them and find that in different places. They're certainly looking in a lot of different places, but I think cultural centers, um, uh, at the end of the day, are one of those one of those touch places where people can land, feel a sense of community. Um, so I think more than ever, the cultural centers are, are um, vital to the work that we're uh, that everyone is trying to do. Now we both. Is this everybody? Yeah. This one here. Last one. All right, how y'all doing? And family, y'all can come yeah, from, uh, from outside because y'all not going to hear nothing out there. Oh, <laughs> y'all want some of these nuggets for sure. Nuggets? You got nuggets? <laughs> <laughs> and breadcrumbs. Everywhere. All right, y'all. So welcome to campus. My name is Dr. Roz. I'm the director here in the Center for Black Culture and Student Affairs. Um, I'm friends with Dean Quist or Dr. Quist. We know each other from a professional organization called Kache. So she just emailed me and told me that she's having some flight issues. So she's going to meet y'all at Roscoe's. Y'all know that? I'm going to Roscoe's. Okay. Y'all yeah, going to Roscoe's after. Um, so this is the Center for Black Cultural and Student Affairs. Um, I've been on campus about five and a half years. I'm originally from Long Beach, California, born. Um, but raised all around Southern California. So ended up in the IE in Rancho Cucamonga. Um, I'm the first in my family to go to college. So um, how many of you are first generation college students? First in your family to earn a degree possibly? Okay, so some of y'all. Um, and I attended UNLV in Las Vegas for my bachelor's degree, um, as well as my master's degree in education. And I'm an alum of USC. I just completed my doctorate in 2016. Um, so they call me Dr. Ross. Um, we are happy to have y'all in our space. This is our, our home. This is the Center for Black Cultural and Student Affairs. We were founded 40 years ago by students out of student activism, right? So out of a need for our students to have a space on campus. So we honor that in our space. We always have students here. Um, we honor that through our programming. We honor that through um, advocacy that we do on behalf of our students. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll pass it to Theo Fowles, soon to be Dr. Fowles. Yeah. In a few weeks, y'all, in a few weeks. Um, so my name's Theo. Uh, I did my undergrad right here at USC. Um, my undergrad degree was in film. But uh, I am the first person in my family to go to college. Um, I was born in New York and raised in Chicago. Both those places are cold. I saw palm trees and I said I'll stay here. Um, but this is the very first place that I came to on campus as a 17-year-old student trying to figure out how this college thing works. Mm -hmm. So literally, there were some couches similar to the ones y'all sitting on right now. And I was like, I'm going to make this my home. Mm -hmm. And I printed from that computer lab, and uh, it afforded me a, a degree and soon my doctorate. Um, so what I do here in the office is I help to manage a lot of the new programs that our office is doing. I help to manage our our Instagram account, which you should all follow, USC underscore CBCSA. Uh, we just hit our thousandth follower this this month, so it was a great Black History for for us, History Month for us. And y'all coming on the last day, so we coming full circle. Okay, so you all. You three went to the same high school yeah. and middle school. Middle school. <laughs> okay, it was predominantly white. Yes. And you came to USC, yes. which is predominantly white. white. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, talk about your experience here because you're not part of the cultural center or the BSA, and why not? Um, I feel for both of us, we just transferred here. Um, we uh, transferred in. This is our second semester here, so I feel. Me personally, uh, I probably have not gone to join BSA or CBSA because I, mostly because I'm still adjusting in my own and it's our first year without athletics and I feel as an athlete, you spend so many years just focusing on like going from six hours a day, just training and then now to just stop. It's an adjustment in itself, and I feel like coming from a predominantly white school, we've just been so used to uh, just finding our independence, not per se, like, uh, well, in our independence we found in being athletic, so I feel like that's why 
Okay. I was here since a freshman, and I am so for the black community, but I went to the BSA meeting and African Americans in Health, and I feel like I didn't fit in <laughs> at all, like personality-wise. I even, I'm a creative also, I even try to be in the creative space, and I just felt like I wasn't being talked to. Like, I just did not feel in my element. And I'm in a lot of clubs because I'm very involved. And a lot of the clubs I'm in, pri primarily white. I even joined this organization that um, our rush year, it, they had two black girls, including me, and an Indian girl. And the other black girl and the Indian girl got cut. And then somebody apparently said that they were being racist. And I looked around and I was like, I'm the only black person here with all these white people. So I was very confused. I was like, are they? But I've always been that girl who didn't experience it. And I, I hate to say that, but even we lived in a racist town. Um, last semester, they were chanting, build a wall at our school and wearing Trump hats and everything. So and, uh, picking up a student. Yeah. And then like, they're just really bad at our school. So it's like, I was never, but I was so cool with the people who weren't so bad, so I always didn't see it, and I'm able to fit in with white people more for some reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, do you think that um, one of the reasons why you haven't become involved is is it the activities they present or the events that they put on, or you're just not interested? Um, no, it's more like she said, um, we're getting used to it and like we start to get the emails and I feel like now, like this semester, I've been seeing more events like, oh, I want to go to that. We've been starting to go to that. Last semester, I didn't see a whole lot of events where I'm just like, that seems interesting. Like, oh, let me go and check that out. But this semester, there's more that we could definitely relate more to and yeah. Okay. I oh, I honestly love the events. I that's why I wanted to join is because I like the events. It was the the meetings that I didn't feel like I was like I didn't feel a part of the group, and um, but the events I'm like I wanted to go to that and I want to go to that and I want to go to that. We went with the Issa Rae, yeah. Yeah. Um, hearing you know the black experience and everything. I love the events that they put on. Um, I get the newsletter still, so I love it. I'm happy. Okay. So. In your situation, what makes you feel comfortable here? Or do you feel comfortable uh, here? I feel comfortable just being around whoever I'm around. Like, I feel like I've always, I, um, I'm the type of person who it's like, I feel like people connect more on their experiences. So I was like, I can relate to Tiffany from the beach more than um, like whoever from the South who's black. It's not all about that. So it's like, I found my way to relate to people through our experiences, what I like, not for being a race. And that may be because of what schools we went oh, to. yeah, for sure. And um, just the adapting to it, I feel like, I don't want to say that we were trained this way, but we're, we're kind of, we're, we're just used to it. Yeah. So we don't have a, any problems adjusting. Mm -hmm. What like, I know they say like, you get into a classroom, like um, all black students feel like, I feel, feel kind of left out in a certain way yeah. but we I don't because I'm where we went to school I I feel going to a class that has like mostly white um, kids mostly because my major is a psychology major and it's mostly just like white women like you really basically we I don't have any problems adjusting to it because of where we went to school we were used to it what do you think like in this current climate, how relevant and how important are they today as opposed to maybe 10, 15 years ago? Um, I think they're equally relevant today as they were uh, back in the 60s. The difference, I think, is that in the late 60s, students were demanding for them to exist. And okay. Uh, at points where they did exist, that would have been where students gathered to sort of, you know, galvanize or whatever. Um, but these days, it looks a little different. Um, I think students still use them, but there are so many other um, opportunities on uh, campuses beyond cultural centers um, that, you know, might focus on diversity or um might make students feel uh, a greater sense of belonging um, that, you know, don't include 
the cultural center. And so I think centers now actually have to compete <laughs> in, right. in some way with other uh, campus functional areas to uh, keep students. And then, so there's this thing um, that I've seen when I've gone on uh, different consulting visits where directors will say, you know, we're doing all of these different things, but sometimes it's hard to get students into the center. Um, part of that has to do with, uh, and one of these days I'm going to do this uh, geographic uh uh, study about how cultural centers are located on the uh, uh, perimeter and the, the margins mm. of campus. So um, they're not in spaces that students would normally go to. They're not on the main thor- thoroughfare of where students, you know, student traffic is. And so I think sometimes that prevents students from going there. But the other piece is that, um, and a lot of cultural centers uh, deal with this critique, and that's that they focus so much on race that um, student, you know, if you're black and you're gay, or you're black and you're poor, or you know, you're black and Latino, you know, do you go to the black culture center, the Latino cultural center? Do you go to, you know, the women's center, the LGBT? So um, the fact that some of these centers are viewed as being too narrow in scope, right? Uh, think uh may prevent you know students so in my mind i think the relevance is still there but how students make sense of why they're there and um the role that a center could play in their lives is uh, has changed significantly yeah so i'm I'm really down for safe spaces the only problem was that it was a little bit too much to be honest um like they really hit in my face that like you can only use i comments which i think is fine but to me i was just so afraid to say something that was going to offend somebody when you know for me part of the biracial experience has always been that you kind of you have to reconcile with a lot of not hypocrisies but a lot of um conflicting and um meshing like themes and and ideas and so i thought it was going to be a space for me to kind of figure out some of the things that i wasn't sure about you know like oh like i'm not really sure how i feel about um like this aspect of my community like how can i get more perspectives on this one and i didn't feel like i could really say that in project remix um and i that doesn't mean that like i don't love what they're doing i think that they have like the idea that there even is a place where it does serve a lot of other students it wasn't my place but it was so important to all these other students I thought that was really great and but I think it only for me stressed that we need more of them because not all it's not a one-size-fits-all there needs to be more spaces so that we can all feel like we found the one that fits our specific needs because not everyone's gonna use it like the way I was gonna use it um, like there were kids who were undocumented that felt like it really needed to have that element for them to feel like uh, they could be accepted so Really That's just one of the reasons why I I felt like there could be a better. There is always still a need for more cultural centers here, but um, they have a lot of things like to do. Do you think it's more important to still have the separate cultural centers, or is it more important to have a multicultural center and disband the others? I believe strongly, actually, from the research that we do at the USC Race and Equity Center that we need to have individual cultural centers for individual groups. Um, because while many people of color have you know, some shared experiences, um, there are some oppressive experiences and interactions that are particular to Latinos and Latinas. There are some others that are particular to Asian American and Pacific Islander. Uh, brothers and sisters and the same to to black folks and Native Americans so on and so forth Um, you know we hear often in our research from black students that they spend their entire day being the only black student in every one of their classes and then they for those who live on campus sometimes they're the only black student on their entire residence hall floor I think that they need a black cultural center that can be a a, a restorative space, a space of cultural celebration and and restoration, a space of cultural education, because we also hear from black students that unless I'm in an African-American studies class, you know, I'm not really learning anything about my blackness or about black history, black culture, black people. Uh, You know, that kind of cultural education tends to happen outside the classroom in cultural centers. Jazz and Sky were designing buttons. I was 
was helping out with signs, and, well, no one was dumb enough to tell Nomi what to do, so she assigned herself her own task. Um, again, this is the second time this year people have complained about how... <laughs> I just wish they realized how important this place was to us, you know? Yeah, no, I totally get it. Minorities need a place where you can go to just be yourself. Exactly. Thank you, Bella. I wish my people had a place like this to go. Well, I can't. I don't know. This seems like so much work. First, you gotta get one open, and then fight to keep it open. I don't know. I'm just not good with big stuff like this. I was told my team saying you had a lack vision. It's easy. A carefully planned protest can definitely help you get your own space, okay? First, you gotta get the word out on social media, then you get your signatures, your permits. Finally, you gotta find someone crazy enough to sponsor a million dollar liability insurance policy. I am Professor Dr. Charles Telfy. You got everything you need. No one can show you down. I think, I think it's critically important uh, to have a cultural center for peoples of color who find themselves on the PWI for a number of reasons. First of all, just psychologically, we want to connect. There is, a, there, there, there is safety and strength in sameness. Now, I'm not just talking about the human race, I understand that. But as far as uh, when you don't see you, if you can go a whole day through a whole campus that has, I don't know, 30,000 people on it, and you don't see one person who looks like you, psychologically, that can impact you. If nothing else, we know that biologically it can, it can move uh, the sympathetic nervous system into arousal. Not out of fear that something's going to happen to you, but out of fear or a sense of concern or anxiety that uh, there is not a sense of familiarity. And the PWI is swarming with familiarity. They don't have that issue, and so what happens sometimes is difficult for them to understand. Well, you know, why do you guys need a black cultural center? Why do you need an Asian American center? Why do you need, you know? And just logistically speaking, too, some people coming to a PWI perhaps have never experienced a great deal of having to perform inside this bubble, not to mention what happens inside of a dominant social structure that already has them painted at a cognitive deficit. And so you want to be careful before you label them as a separatist group. Mm -mm, it's an important group, I think. So I'm at IU, Indiana University, but uh, the cultural centers in Bloomington look so different from what's in Indianapolis. So right. in Bloomington, you have, um, which is a flagship, so you have like, you know, you have a Latino cultural center, you have uh, the Black Cultural Center, you have Native American Student Services, um, you have an Asian American Cultural Center, and they were all established in the 60s. Um, and they, aside from the Black Cultural Center, you know, they're in these smaller houses. Um, and... and so for alums who remember IU, they, you know, love the fact that it's this smaller space. It feels homey. It feels like a supportive environment. But technically, that's not enough space and it's not enough resources for directors to really do right. um, the sort of work that they would want to do as far as serving such large populations. Um, and so I think that tension is always there. If we stay in this house, then it sort of represents home and support and belongingness, but it doesn't really allow much latitude for a director to, to do more things, uh, unless there's some sort of collaboration with Residence Life or uh, the union board or something like that. Um, but when you come all the way to Indianapolis, which is, um, uh, a, a core campus within the, within the IU system, it's only recently that a multicultural center was established. Hmm. And that, you know, happened in the 90s where, you know, black students were protesting. And even now, uh, one of the challenges is that I think when black students were protesting, their goal was to have a black culture center. But it's a multicultural center. So, okay. um you have questions like, well, if we do a black cultural center, then the Latino students will want a cultural center and the Asian students will want a cultural center. And we don't know if we have enough resources, so let's just do a multicultural center. Uh, and so 
there are all of these philosophical debates on what's the right model to serve students. Um, and even though that's going on here, I think the director has done a good job of um, uh, doing programs are, that are cross-culturally focused while also attending to, you know, the different individual group needs and even some some of the diversity within group diversity. Um, that's still, again, not enough. She's a, you know, a director with a limited staff. Uh, and so one of the things that I think, regardless of what campus you're talking about, usually it's the cultural center or multicultural affairs office that is uh, heavily under-resourced, but um, deals with heavy expectations for you know, not only supporting, you know, students of color, but also, you know, helping the admissions office when they need someone to come and talk about diversity or, you know, in res life and they need someone to talk about diversity or when they need somebody to co-sponsor something so that it looks diverse. Uh, there is a lot of uh, overworking when it comes to uh, cultural center directors and a significant burnout. It's ridiculous. At a wealthy university like USC, resources tend not to be the problem, though the university's cultural centers, all of them, could stand to use more staff. The Asian Cultural Center, for example, has two people, and last year it served, according to their records, about 4,000 students in various ways. The same is true for students serving black, Latino, and LGBTQ students. The need is there, as USC admits more diverse students across degrees and disciplines. More broadly, these centers could provide anchors for discussion or focus groups, uh, however you want to identify them, to engage the broader university community. There's an emerging trend on college campuses that says diversity efforts and an understanding uh, of this space is everyone's responsibility. Well, That's so here's, the, to me, here's the big challenge. The big challenge is and, and it's an opportunity as well, is this idea of intersectionality, right? I mean, um, I think part of the, the real issue, uh, or one of the things we're gonna have to figure out is, it's not that there's just one identity that people uh, identify with typically. And so, so how do those cultural centers, which often are about a single point of identity, how do they stay relevant and how do, can they uh, best serve? And so, you know, we get, uh, uh, Dr. Kerry and I have had a lot of conversations as I have had with uh, the heads of our cultural centers here about how do we, in a time when we could have, you know, we, we have demands for dozens and dozens of cultural centers because people feel a different kind of identity, how do we actually m make that work? Um, when we don't have infinite resources, so we know that they're vital, how do you create a framework for intersectionality to happen and people to still feel, still feel like they have a sense of where they can land? Um, so that to me is the, is the big challenge and those are the, you know, I think everyone's facing, facing those challenges, but that would be the one that I would, ch you know, and I have asked Dr. Kerry and the cultural centers and student governments here and everyone to think about is, how do we actually make that work? And let's put our investments in what would be a 21st century version of cultural centers. What does that mean? Uh, how can we serve the most people? And, and, and that's, that's to me is the big challenge. So in a perfect world, how would cultural centers really thrive in this current climate? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, that's a, a, a big question. Uh, I think uh, there are, um, a lot of challenges within the current climate uh, outside of even just the uh, financial constraints and squeezes in universities across the country. Uh, there is definitely a, an increase in tension on how universities are uni using their resources, especially the resource investments of outside classroom support. Uh, and unfortunately, cultural centers have not been immune to that increase um, scrutiny and squeeze in terms of resources, and I think that's um, applied across the country. There's been a real shift in um, the culture and in terms of the, the attitude and expectation of higher education as a whole, uh, and what higher education should produce or, or provide outside the classroom. Uh, that really puts us in this 
this un un unusual, and I say uncomfortable position when we're providing these support services and we're outside the classroom learning. So it's, it's definitely um, a space where we're commonly thinking of what would be ideal because I don't think we're in the ideal right now, um, but I think that applies to a lot of places in student affairs. Uh, and so many pieces of student support services are so important. Uh, and again, the cultural centers are such a, an important piece of that. Um, we'll add to that also the changing demographics of our students um, in this country, in higher education. Uh, we're seeing more and more students who identify with multiple backgrounds or identify as multi-ethnic and multicultural. Uh, and so I think that's adding additional challenges to our cultural center environments across the country, whether they're cultural specific or multicultural. Um, it's adding this, this um, invitation for all of us to consider how are we evolving uh, and supporting our evolving demographics. So we are, we're definitely in an environment where we have an opportunity to envision the ideal, um, but we also have a lot of challenge in terms of how we make that happen and do the best with what we have. Uh, what do you think are the advantages of all of you all working together? <laughs> um, I think there's an opportunity really just to demonstrate to the university that we're more than just any one of our departments um, and that we really are here for all students across the university um, and that the opportunity for us to engage with each other's um, Populations and the students that we interact with, I think, is something that is truly unique and special here on campus, and that doesn't really happen um, elsewhere um, across this mighty fine campus. Uh, so, thinking about our students who have multiple marginalized identities, um, it's really important that they not only have opportunities to, um, you know, explore the, you know, the intersections of those identities, but also to see. Um, you know, staff, um, you know, doing that work. Um, I think that that is really um, motivational, or not motivational, but inspiring and encourages them. I think um, well, strength brings unity, right? And I think there's a lot of intersectionality and issues that we need to come together for, for the best for our students, um, for the community at SC. And uh, I think the interesting about thing about it is we're still able to do our own individual work, which is super important, and focus on our community and stay focused, but yet come together. So we're able to really do like a great job of balancing. And ultimately, there's power in you know diversity and numbers and coming together. So makes makes us all better, I think, ultimately. Would you ever be in favor of just having one multicultural center as opposed to the central? No, I would be in favor of having in, additional, in addition a multi or cross-cultural or intercultural center in addition to ethnic specific. I think ethnic specific is so crucial and important and not enough time is devoted to each of our individual communities that is needed. Um, but I also think that intersectional work and cross-cultural work and bringing other communities together is also valuable, which is why I think having its own entity in addition would be really helpful. That's actually a national trend across the country and particularly in California where ethnic specific models have added an intercultural center or the reverse. They had an intercultural center and they didn't have ethnic and they added ethnic specific centers. So at the center we have Real Talk Tuesdays where basically we talk about issues going on in our lives in the U.S. on campus and many students bring up that they have experience with professors and peers in a classroom setting where they're made felt uncomfortable, where issues are brought up about using the N-word or people are just not educated and coming from a background where they can speak on different people's experiences. So I think that that's very unfortunate that people are still experiencing these things on a progressive campus like USC and that USC isn't making sure that all students feel that this is a safe place for them. What kind of issues have you had here at USC? Um, you know, a lot of microaggressions, you know, 
um, in classrooms, definitely the subtle invalidation of my perspective and opinions on situations, um, even when I'm clearly more knowledgeable about certain things or whatever. But like even just like socially, just walking around campus, you know, I'm big, um, like 6'3", of an afro. So I definitely can tell when people are looking over their shoulders and looking at me. And you know, I feel relatively like this is a safe area of campus, but you know, I've had definitely some encounters where white people especially or like stop whole conversations or even jog past me like I'm coming out to get them like the boogeyman or something. So, you know, um and I am um, not used to being in a predominantly white space. I'm from Oakland. And not that there aren't white people there, but it's just, it's a, it's a different climate. And I can always find easy um, respite amongst black people. So here, CBCSA is definitely a, um, a place of rest and an oasis, really. What do you blackness. think life would be like for you without CB? CSA here. Mm, wow. Um, I probably would not be here. What about you, Cece? What I kind can't of issues? relate to everything, but I can relate to some things. Uh, I'm foreign. I, I wasn't international not anymore, but a lot of people think that, oh, CC doesn't work that way, or they want to ask me twice about something because they think I'm, I don't understand. A lot of people, like, misguide my knowledge based on where I'm from. And I do realize there is discrimination, particularly with one event that happened last semester. Mm. Due to my lighter complexion, people don't assume what I am. Right. They keep on like, oh, it's getting confused. This happened at the tailgate. Right, right, right. And I realized what privilege and racism meant on the side of the opposer, even though I've always been historically the victim of racism or discrimination. It's when the security force, or whatever you want to call it, came up to us, and we were in a group of brothers, and what happens, they talk with everybody except me. So I was like... In, like a, in a type of reprimand. Exactly. Were, you guys need to calm down. And I yeah. was wondering, whoa, what's going on? Why aren't they treating me the same as my brothers? Because I'm used to being... Because I'm Rifi. We're used to being put down back home. But this was the first time I realized, okay, this is me switching places, and discrimination does exist on a campus which is really prestigious, known for its diversity, known for being the a rising school and everything. And I love USC, but it's one thing that's maybe minor, but we can't ignore it, because it did happen. And it was very obvious at that point that clearly they thought I was white and they were treating me better than my brothers who were darker than me. Okay, have you ever had any unpleasant uh, incidents happen here? Certainly. Um, so I know immediately after the Trump election, it didn't happen to me personally, but to a lot of close friends of mine where they were getting harassed, um, they were being called the N-word and things like that. Um, and so it was a very like hostile environment on campus. Um, so I think that's also a huge time where we all kind of rally together to just support each other through that awful transition of a time. And what psychological effect do you think um, certain racial incidents have, have on uh, students of color at PWIs? Does it stay with them? Or are, they, are you able to shake it off? No, I think it does stay with you. I mean, even in me recounting the things I lived throughout Wisconsin, I was getting kind of emotional because it was those things you kind of put in the back of your head. Um, I think when you live through those things and no one is explicitly saying it's not all right and they're not doing anything to show that it's not all right, it becomes almost second nature for you to to kind of have, like, your defense is to try to do things that people can't attack you for or do things where you don't really stand out. And I think that's watering yourself down. Like, for example, if I will go to a class and I'm so insecure to the point I'm like let me straighten my hair so I don't have to worry about you know my hair standing out or what I wear stand out or telling people my music of preference or my politics you know it's just so many things where you could use 
watering yourself down to kind of serve as a defense mechanism and that that takes away so much from not only yourself but others that could learn from you um and that alters the environments of the school i mean we're supposed to learn from our peers and if you're not bringing your full self to the table you can't do that um i have one more thought and it also makes you feel like less than you know it it takes away from what you could be learning because you're overthinking so many things like you can't really focus in the classroom if you're you know on pins and needles like hoping no one says anything offensive or hoping um you don't get offended so then people can flip on you and say oh you're being sensitive you know you just want to focus on the things you came here to focus on without people making you feel like you're unwanted or don't belong so as a student at usc i mean talk about the climate of being a person of color what's the climate like now post trump <laughs> So coming to USC, it was no secret that I was going to be coming to a university that was predominantly white. And I also know that USC said that there was a lot of diversity, but when I got here, I realized what they meant by diversity, it was a different type of diversity. So there's not a lot of people who look like me. When I look at other campuses that might even be majoritively white, they still have larger percentage of black students, they have larger they have like larger communities that I wish I could identify with. So when I look at USC, I think that one, we need to work on admitting more students that look like me, giving them scholarship opportunities, knowing that it doesn't just stop at an acceptance letter because sometimes not everyone, if not most of the black community is not gonna pay that 70K a year. So I think that in this climate, I think that it's very important that universities use this as a chance to bring in students of color, bring in students from different populations that are just gonna bring more diversity into the classroom, diversity in the on campus, and just make everyone on campus, whether they are a student of color or not, more well-rounded in the end. Okay. And what do you say to the kid who says they don't feel they belong? Even if they go to the Black Cultural Center, Latino Cultural Center, they don't feel a sense of belonging because maybe they grew up in a predominantly white situation yeah so I don't say anything to them actually I instead ask them a series of questions about you know why don't you feel like you belong what is happening in the space that engenders for you feelings of marginality um, how can the staff and the educators who work in that space reconstruct and redesign the space for you and people like you to increase and engender feelings of belonging. Um, so yeah, I tend to ask more questions and then I take what I hear back to the cultural educators in the space to help them figure out how to make the space much more inclusive in a purposeful way, not in a like accidental ad hoc, but like in a, in a really purposeful way based on, again, the, the intel and the insights that we've gotten from uh, students about their experiences in that environment. Now, I've spoken with students who say that they don't feel they belong here at USC, nor do they feel they belong in the cultural centers for whatever reason. What, what would you say to that kid? Yeah, I would, what I would say to them is to speak up, talk, let us know um, uh, how you're feeling. Uh, introspect about why you think that is and what we could do to make that better. I mean, we are trying to create a climate of inclusion. Um, and, uh, and that means understanding where the problems are and, and how we can uh, help address them. And um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's incredibly saddening and frustrating for me to hear that um, uh, we have students uh, on campus who say, listen, I just don't feel like I'm a part. And, and we, need to, we need to, one, be really honest about understanding that and that um, and not discount that and recognize that people do feel disconnected and at a time when people really are feeling like they need to be connected that's the worst thing we can be doing so let's let's take an honest look let's be serious about recognizing that we have people on our campus as welcoming as we want to feel that it is it isn't to everyone so what is it that we need to do and let's put some action plans in place to say, you know, if it's not cultural centers, it's something else, but let's figure out what that is and, 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 and try to improve it.
they could be very apologetic, right? They could they can say this was horrible, this shouldn't have happened, you know. We we here at this institution we value diversity, blah blah blah. But the people that are getting in or the people in the classrooms don't necessarily reflect that. And I think that's a bit difficult for like the top notch people to shift the mindsets of a whole like campus of like nearly forty thousand, but I think there could be more effort in distinguishing right from right and wrong from wrong from the beginning and no gray area of um, opinions that make a person feel less than human. So I teach here in the journalism school and I also work in the media center which is uh, our hands-on learning lab really where the students are producing content, uh, journalism across all different platforms. And I think that the cultural centers are really important because I think that the journalism industry has a problem, right? And the problem is that the journalism industry is not representative of the people that it covers. And I think we have a responsibility to be part of facing that problem and addressing it head on. And so our student body, I think it's important that our student body is diverse, but our responsibilities don't stop when students get admitted, right? Like we have to be really conscious of what it takes to succeed. And I believe that part of what it takes to succeed for any human being or any student is feeling a sense of belonging and feeling a sense of purpose. And I think that a lot of organizations can contribute to that. And, and you know, particularly for students um, from underrepresented groups, that that can be an important way of bolstering a sense of connection, of bolstering social support, of bolstering a feeling like, yeah, I am part of the Trojan family. And I think that's one of the most important missions that we have. It's definitely necessary here. I think a lot of students, I haven't found that as much time to go, but I know the students that did go when they were giving me the tour of it last school year, they really loved it because they felt like this was a place that they could just come and study with people and it's just kind of uplift each other, you know, depending on what happened that week and it's been a really good thing for people for sure. Okay, so without serious involvement yourself, do you feel that you fit in the um, environment here pretty well? Um, like... I think in the media center, um, I know that compared to other majors and other programs, it's way more diverse. So I know that if I wasn't in this kind of program, I wouldn't have felt that, but I wouldn't have felt like I belonged. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I think that's part of why maybe I haven't needed to, as much as another student in a different program to reach out to the cultural center as much. But I do think that I feel pretty much like I belong here. Um, but there's always that need to kind of connect with, you know, the people in the cultural center. I must say, though, in my, I'm an occupational therapist major, and that's just being in that field, I do feel a little bit left out because we're, we're addressing these type of issues. And I have no problem raising my hand and giving them, hey, this is what I went through. Mm -hmm. And I get people coming up to me, thank you so much for telling me your story. I didn't know that could happen to anyone. And I'm just like, now that we're having discussions, I'm like, this is different from in high school when it's just like, oh, you're the only black person and this is a simple class, it's fine. But discussion-wise, when people are like relating your story to you, it's, or to them, it's like, it's different. Now, on a campus like this, have you ever felt excluded mm. in a classroom setting or just because, you know, uh, you're part of the, this word we don't like to use anymore, minority here? Not necessarily because of I am a minority. Um, I am a student with a disability. Mm -hmm. I have um, oculotaneous albinism type 2, also known as just albinism. Um, sometimes in class, it varies, depends. If it's a larger class, then yes, because since I have to sit in the very front row to be able to actually see anything, you know, students don't want to sit in the front row, everyone wants to sit in the back. So I would say that's probably the only time that I would feel left out. But because I am a very social and very kind of uh, talkative person, I remedy, remedy that by just talking to people, being very social, things of that nature. Okay. First of all, let me know, ask you, do you know about the cultural centers here at USC? Um, I know about a few of them. Okay. Like the ones that, I guess we say, would pertain to me, like the CBCSA, which is for African-American students. Um, I know there is an Asian American center on that same floor, and a Hispanic center on that same floor as well, all in a student union. 
Okay. I knew of them, but I didn't know where they were. So, I yeah, I know they exist, but I wouldn't, if someone said, like, oh, where is this, I wouldn't know where to say. Okay. Well, as an international student, do you understand the necessity for them at a camp, on a campus like this? Yeah. I mean, I count as an international student, and um, so just, like, being in that community, I see a lot of people who literally don't speak English, and they come to school here, and it's a whole different transition. So, for those kids, like, I really see the benefit in it. Um, it is... I mean, I, we go through the regime. I just got my green card, so now I'm, like, off the hook. But um, before, we would go through all these, like, passport verification ses sessions and whatever. And you meet kids who are just, like, literally here alone for school. And so for that kind of stuff, I'm sure it's so helpful to try and, like, find your little clique. And then I'm also an expat society here, um, which is basically all international students or kids who travel a ton and have moved around their whole life. And through that, like, I've really found so many people that just aren't from here and, like, really only identify with other expats. So. Okay. And what about you, Jordan? Um, how, how has it enhanced your life here? Um, I think it just, in terms of a community, they can always turn to, I think, uh, which is good because you're going to find your groups of friends, whether that be through Greek life, whether that be through, you know, clubs and stuff or classes or people you live with. But having the cultural center with people who are like you, maybe gone through similar experiences, really give you a group of friends or even a family that you can trust. Like I, I know people who are in the BSA and are going to have lifelong friends. I know people who I'm friends with in the BSA who I know I'm going to know for the rest of my life, who I've known since the beginning of freshman year. So it kind of just provides a real community and a real space that I think a lot of other places here on USC doesn't really have, don't really have and don't really provide. And how it could be better. Um, I think just making sure that everyone knows about the events. I mean, there's social media, but also just word of mouth and everybody bringing everyone in, I think is a really good thing, especially with transfer students when they don't know a lot. I think in terms of doing right, I think the center is always on top of game in terms of helping students kind of feel, feel a part of something, feel a part of a community that actually, that does care for them, that wants to try and be inclusive. In terms of what I think it could improve, hmm, that's kind of difficult. Hmm. One thing I will say, and I feel that all of these centers here that we have on campus could improve on is kind of that interconnection between each other, whether it be between CBCSA and APAS or the LGBT community. I feel that us being able to connect more so together would be something that I think everyone can improve on. Um, I think outreach specifically, it's always a big thing when it comes to centers like these, cultural centers specifically, because you're, when you have students that are coming in from all over the country, all over the world, you need to find a way that you can reach. You find a way you can reach to that, reach them in a way that is gonna, they're gonna hear and they're gonna see and they're gonna want to come back over and over, not just one time. Kind of look at the center and be like, oh, this is cool, and then just never come back again. So, a sense of like outreach and consistency, like upon that outreach, I think is really important. I think a lot of the centers can do a better job of that. The question comes up oftentimes. The question comes up oftentimes in the cultural center environment. Why and what are they doing right? Maybe they should do more of this. It could be more effective. Maybe they should do less of that. It would seem less separatist. And then maybe they could be embraced more by the PWI, but nobody ever asked the PWI students. What could you do better? What could you do less of? You see, the onus is always on those who are different. Isn't that what we're fighting? I hate to use the word fighting, but isn't that what we are concerned about right now is the why we have the, the cultural groups in the first place? And that's why they have them. It's not a separatist group designed to remove them from the uh, mainstream campus. What I'm really trying to get people to understand is it's just because they have a separate group does not remove them from being mainstream. Everybody's mainstream, and it's about coming together and understanding each other's differences and similarities, but not to the exclusion. They're not mutually exclusive, are they? Maybe that's the question that has to be asked. I think that's a better question people should ask. You know, there is a viable solution. Uh, I don't think institutions implement it. So the viable solution would be to um, hire or, you know, provide the, the monetary resources to hire 
people, Mm -hmm. you know, who can do this work. But, you know, the argument then becomes, well, the career career services is also under-resourced and, you know, academic advising is also under-resourced. But the difference is that, you know, there's not a single institution that doesn't, you know, uh, tout, you know, we're a diverse campus and we value diversity and, you know, we, uh, we want underrepresented students here. And, you know, there's a lot of talk but there's not a lot of, uh, you know, money right. behind that. And I think, uh, too, there is this separation. So people think, oh, if we focus too much on diversity, then does that lower our academic, you know, rigor? Um, whereas I believe in, you know, uh, the model of inclusive excellence. So you don't have academic excellence if you don't also have, you know, diversity and, you know, equitable uh, policies and, uh, behaviors associated with the work you do. Um, so one is resources, how resources get distributed. Um, I would love to see uh, uh, some sort of movement among uh, cultural center directors or you know folks on campuses who do diversity initiatives to you know come together and make you know some statement. Um, about the work they do and the fact that institutions need to be more supportive, but I'm also aware that they're in a vulnerable position. Um, so many directors, uh, they don't have a PhD um, or an advanced degree, which might sort of serve as the capital that they need to be at these conversations t- uh, taking place above them. Um, and I, I don't think... You know, people don't go to college and learn to be, you know, a diversity, uh, a chief (laughs) diversity officer or uh, a cultural center director. And so right now, and I would love to see this happen, too. I just haven't had time. But I would love to see some sort of institute or, you know, leadership institute that helps to train uh, directors so that they have a sense of, you know, uh, institutional policy and politics they know uh, what the stakes are when they advocate in particular ways, um, especially when uh, what they're advocating might not sit well with a president or board of trustees. Uh, you know, what, what might the consequences be? Uh, issues around budget. So centers do a ton of work, but they're so busy working that there isn't a lot of time to evaluate for them to say, I did this. You know, and this has affected, you know, uh, student retention or it's contributed to graduation rates uh, increasing. Several studies indicate that when cultural centers are available to students, that there is a high rate of graduation uh, for students of color. On campuses for both two-year, four-year, public and private, where there are centers, the centers tend to be well-resourced. They house counselors who provide academic support, and they also provide comfortable environments where students of color can decompress from the rigors of their school day, because many universities now realize, many of them somewhat belatedly, that there aren't necessarily set up to meet the needs of students, staff, and faculty of color, and in many cases, um, African-American students. So as an employee of the center, what do you feel are some of the challenges the center still faces? I feel like the center still faces one outreach, so there's a lot of students who will come to the center as upperclassmen and they're like, I didn't know this existed. And that's really surprising because the students who do come to the center regularly are getting amazing experiences. They're having engaging conversations with their peers, they're getting resources from our mentors, from our directors, and it's just really a great community and it's surprising to think that somebody didn't hear about it from a USC pamphlet when they were applying to college or when they got here. There was an orientation to get introduced to all of the cultural centers if you identify with one of those centers. So I think one is outreach. Two, there's so many ideas that the directors talk about, the employees talk about that we want to fulfill, but there's only so much time in the day, there's only so much budget, so I think just expanding, expanding the events that we're having, so the 40th year is a great chance for us to experiment with some of those events that we want to work with. If the center didn't exist, 
How do you think your life here would change? Hmm. Well, for the first two years when I was here at SC, I actually didn't even know about it. So I'll base off of that. Um, I would say it wouldn't so much change in a drastic way. It would. I would feel that there would be something missing. That there's something that there's a piece that's definitely missing. Oh no! Nah. This is my family. This is my this is my second home in Los Angeles. It's I literally come here every day. Now less because I'm more busy, but it's just that a few things I can talk about. I can talk about it here. Anything I can't or feel uncomfortable doing outside, which I might feel like, oh. This is foreign, or this might not go along with the rest of the community at USC, or they might think of me like some way or the other. I can like test it out here or talk with my family here first, then we'll see what can go on. They're kind of the guiding throughout life in America, the new life in America, as an African immigrant. Yeah. So, as you know, um, I've done kind of a complete study on mm -hmm. this cultural center, and I've talked with experts around the country, some of our administrators here, including Provost Quick and Dr. Carey, mm -hmm. and um, some faculty and some students. So, first I'd like to ask you, what, what do you think is your biggest challenge right now, and what are you working on to get past it? Uh, I think our biggest challenge right now is um, getting ourselves out there, our, mm -hmm. our story. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the biggest questions we have is, you know, where are we? Where, where, where can you find us? Right. And, mm -hmm. and how do you uh, shape that for not only students, but faculty and staff as well, so okay. mm -hmm. uh, kind of taking us out of the shadows, per se, and, and into some some limelight. So, um, you know, over the past year, that's looked like, you know, getting mm -hmm. our followers on social media up right. to over a thousand on Instagram, Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, making sure that um, incoming students know exactly where we are, um, and then really working with um, admissions to make sure that we're at events where right, uh, exactly. we can be seen and uh, and uh, people can come visit us because I think uh, you know when you're in a classroom and you're the only one, it's kind of hard to mm -hmm. uh, to see what the community is like. Mm -hmm. But when you actually come to our space or come to an event, then you have a really good idea of what it could be like or, or what we're yeah. trying to go for. Because I think if more students knew what this space was like, mm -hmm. I mean, I like hanging out here, mm -hmm. you know, um, that it's such a cool vibe and mm -hmm. a cool mix of people and you can just chill out. Mm -hmm. And it is a safe space. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think all of that will work. And I can add, I would say also one of the, some of the, the challenges are um, with us being new leadership in our roles, um, looking at what we do in the center, uh, mm -hmm. with us just finishing our departmental review. Mm -hmm. And now I always say balancing like our programming needs versus the high touch in terms of meeting with students one-on-one -on -one is mm -hmm. an ongoing kind of challenge because we're trying to figure out how do we um, engage with all student, all black students, because mm -hmm. our purview technically is all black students at the university. Um, and I know there's students that we're missing. Right. Right. We see the same um, in terms of students that engage with the office. I think we're starting to see some of the same folks. So how do we engage those students who are not seeing? Right. 
right. um, or who may think they don't see themselves in CBCSA. Right. Um, and again, that comes with the balance of outreach with programming and then um, trying to engage with the one-on-one -on -one okay. with students. Okay. Yeah. Now, one of the things I'm, I'm going to help you with um, is, you know, I'm famous for being able to do things with a dime. Mm -hmm. So yes. these suggestions that I'm going to make to you are dime, ten cent suggestions. Okay. Um, one, I think uh, all of I mean all the cultural centers have to work to create uh, stronger relationships, not with the deans, but with the dean's assistants. Mm -hmm. You know, because they actually run everything. Yeah. And um, I know uh, Dean Daly's assistant, um, Disa Philadelphia, wants to work with you, mm. but she didn't know. How to do that? Mm -hmm. So you know, it's a matter of just sending out mm -hmm. some emails and connecting with those folks, okay. so that they make their bosses aware of mm -hmm. what's going on. And so you know, that probably will create some future collaborations, especially with places like SCA and Annenberg, mm -hmm. who, you know, that do a lot of events. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, identify students who can um, reach the stragglers to mm -hmm. the folks who say they don't feel. Mm -hmm a sense of belonging and you know mm -hmm. we need to kind of understand why mm -hmm. and this is something that you know the provost said deeply concerned him mm -hmm. that it you know he was really hurt by the fact that uh, kids of color don't feel welcome mm -hmm. here or mm -hmm. in some of these centers mm -hmm. and um, you know you mentioned uh, working <coughs> with admissions uh, mm -hmm. so that when they have events that you have a presence there and that's very important as well. And, um, you know, just having social uh, uh, events in partnership with other campus organizations, even if mm -hmm. it's the kids on the row. Uh -huh. You know, maybe you do a Greek day, combine the Divine Nine mm -hmm. with them and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of afraid of that, but <laughs> no, see what other happens. Other schools do it. Yeah. They have Greek yeah. week yeah. and yeah. They, yeah. they pair them up. Yeah, and, like yeah. a Greek fest, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. um, sometime maybe in September, you mm -hmm. know, beginning of semester. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think one thing that the four of you could do, and you, you may have done this already, but, you know, create town hall meetings around issues mm -hmm. that rise up in the news mm -hmm. so that everybody can come together and, you know, I think that would foster a better understanding mm -hmm. of what these centers do and why they're important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, just uh, really creating those relationships at the mm -hmm. various schools with the administrators there is going to be mm -hmm. huge help. Okay, so unfortunately Theo had to leave us, but mm -hmm. um, I think uh, this promo that um, I've worked on is still rough, mm -hmm. but um, so it's like we have student A and we have like five students. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one says C, is care and concern, a safe place in the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. B is for beautiful. A, nur a nurturing experience I'll remember for the rest of my life. C, conscientious, we, we are woke and wise. S, solid, a great foundation that will help inform our futures. A, appreciative, we are respected and honored for who we are and not what we are. And then the tag is come home to CBCSA, your family awaits you just as you are. Love it. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was trying to work that all us we Mm -hmm. thing in there but that's maybe another promo so yeah, that'll like probably it. be yeah the second one and we can pull clips from your events mm -hmm. and with you know those great shirts mm -hmm. and all that and um, I think really sort of get those stragglers that um, aren't sure what you do or what you're for mm -hmm. to come in because I think that's the most important element of yeah. this and also in doing this I think this is something you can give to the uh, various admissions mm -hmm. officers Mm -hmm. uh, that they can send out this link with the packets mm -hmm. um, that are going to new or prospective students so that they know that you're here before they even get here. Yes. So I think that's the advance notice is mm -hmm. a key cog in all of this too. So I think what we're looking at is, you know, working on the Greek Fest yes. and contacting the um, various uh, presidents and heads of those organizations, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think there are many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. yeah, yeah, and you know, that will work, I think, uh, to help bring recognition to the Divine Nine who 
just you don't you just don't see them. So they need to have a bigger presence on campus. And I think the bigger their presence, the bigger your presence right. will be as well. And um, to create some town halls, mm -hmm. you know, maybe uh, next October once people get settled in, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be some issue. Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> there'll be some issue. You know, Trump will have said something mm -hmm. or, um, you know, there'll be something going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in that because I think it's a way to unite this entire campus, which is as divided as the nation. And um, also, we've got, um, uh, you know, Really, the other key part is, you know, creating those relationships with the dean's offices mm -hmm. and, um, you know, trying to just increase the social media awareness mm -hmm. as well. Because I think even if you or Theo just got on once a day and said, hey, mm -hmm. you know, come over to CBC, we're doing this, mm -hmm. or we've got free cookies or mm -hmm. pizza or something like that. You know, um, that's always a pull for all the students here, mm -hmm. food, free, free food. food, yeah. Um, and again, to just bring them into this lovely nest that mm -hmm. you have up here and the other um, cultural centers are on this floor. And mm -hmm. this, it's great because Lori was telling me one thing that one of the problems uh, cultural centers have nationwide is that no one knows where they are. Yep. And they're usually in these obscure they're places. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, at That's least you're true. in a kind of main traffic yeah. thoroughway here that... Well, people still can't find us because of the signage, right. and I right. think that's a little bit of USC, really? just the aesthetic of campus, because at some schools they do have signage on outside of buildings, Okay. but um, yeah, that okay. has a little bit to do with okay. how manicured our campus is, right. and limits on signage and things. Right, and if we can get... Um, you know, the promos on the display. Yeah, that would be great. And at, on uh, Truesdale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would, yeah, yeah, because students actually do stop and look they at those. They do. Yeah. In the residence hall. So yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. TVs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And have you ever gone into, like, Summer Ball, Somerville and had, like, sort of a meeting or um we do back in the day they used to do programs on somerville place but because of all the security access to get in the buildings right. now right. you have to have someone you know have a guest swipe you in right. and all that extra stuff so a lot of our student groups don't do events on the floor anymore right. just because it's just too much but um we check in with them from time to time during at their floor meetings and um you know, for those students, again, we don't get all of them that come over here, but we do kind of pop up on the floor every right. now and then and check in on them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So in short, I'm going to recommend that we meet at least uh, once a month mm -hmm. to go over some potential ideas, um, mm -hmm. you know, starting with the Greek Fest. And uh, maybe that's something we can get the ball rolling on before kids leave. Mm -hmm. And um, also to, you know, create some cool hashtags mm -hmm. to um, bring kids in and then um, you do do you do anything around spring fling or um, we typically do our alternative spring break around springtime okay the civil rights movement okay. spring break so a lot of our energy goes there okay. and then campus wide they do a big concert spring fest okay so, but that's more student run okay mm -hmm. and, and we should think about collaborating with some of the schools either mm -hmm. education school um mm -hmm. sca or annenberg about the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. 1968 because i, I think collectively i mean we one of those schools can provide the space yes needed and collectively i think we could come up with a panel mm -hmm. uh that would really like Turn this school mm -hmm. on its edge, mm -hmm. and it's something uh, particularly students of color need to know about because it is very much informing their yes. present right now. So um, I think that's that's it. Um, and um, you know, we'll work on getting those relationships with the dean started right mm -hmm. away before everything breaks down. I know this is a horrible time of year to like get anybody's attention. I know. But you know, yes. we just put that bug yeah. in your ear and just keep bugging mm -hmm. them through the summer and something will happen. Yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you for putting this together. Oh thank you. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. Okay. No you don't